live. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to another episode of CornCon Cube. That's CornCon continuing content. Yes, I consider myself clever. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> please uh, uh, join us today to talk. I, so, oh my gosh, I, bleh. let's try that again. Welcome to, to an interview with Gilles Messier, um, who we will talk to about all kinds of things from engineering to uh, writing fiction and how those two things intertwine and many things besides. Um, thanks everyone for, for being here. Thank you Gilles so much for, for coming. And um, the very first thing I wanna do though is remind everyone that QuarenCon, the actual convention is April 7th to 11th. And we are just uh, getting our schedule finalized right now. So everyone, please get excited for that and keep an eye on our Twitter account and all of our other social media for updates as they come. Um, again, Jill, thank you for joining us. I appreciate you uh, taking the time. Um, oh, and one <laughs> appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and we're one of the main things that we're talking about, I should make sure I mentioned, is uh, your, your, you've got a new book out. Um, and it yes. is, I believe, your debut. Is that correct? Yes, uh, um, not my debut books, my debut novel. I had a collection of short stories okay. called Our Own Devices out a couple of years ago, but uh, no, this is my first novel. All right, so uh, debut full-length novel, Colonial Stations. Colonial Stations. Yeah. yeah. Hardcover edition Ooh, just beautiful. came out and it feels so nice. Yay, that's such a great feeling. Nice. Um, I don't think it ever gets old, like holding the physical book in your hand after you've uh, gone from idea to actual book. Um, you and there's know. something about hardcover that just feels so much more legit. <laughs> they are. They're very, they're very nice to, to hold. Um, so congratulations on that. And congratulations on your launch, which I believe was about uh, a few weeks ago. It was a few weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. Still waiting um, to do uh, a launch through McNally or something like that. They haven't gotten yes. back to me. But no, yeah, the, the <laughs> book came out and was available on Freezing Press, on Amazon, yeah. yeah, a couple of weeks ago. So it's been nice. Nice. And this is a virtual launch of sorts. So we will be, um, you'll be doing a reading later. And, uh, and once we've um, started with some introductory questions, and then we'll do a reading, and then we'll go back to specific questions about the book. Um, so uh, we'll start with um, silliness. I, you know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with our foreign con programming, but I tend to uh, do a mix of getting to know you as a person and talking about some sort of random stuff and then also talking about um your your works in uh literature or what have you depending on who i'm talking to in your case this book um well that so, works well because my personality is best described as a bunch of random stuff <laughs> that uh that sounds that sounds somewhat accurate uh, <laughs> mine mine probably is too um, all right, so the very first topic, of course, we have to get the important stuff out of the way right off the bat. Um, please show us your cats. <laughs> okay, I'll see if I can track them down. <laughs> this little gremlin is eating oh. all of the wet food that was meant oh, for yes. us. This is Friday, so she's Hi, the Friday. baby. <laughs> and they're yeah. whiny, whiny baby at that, oh, and let me go get the other one. Okay. <laughs> This is my old girl. This is Shadow. Hi, Shadow. Shadow and I have met before. I don't know if I actually have met Friday in person yet. Have I? No, we, I got her right before quarantine started, like right before the right. pandemic. Yeah, so she hasn't actually seen all that many people yeah. <laughs> outside of myself. So Yeah, I feel for a lot of the, the quarantine pets who may not have gotten the same level of socialization that they might otherwise. We mm -hmm. have, we, I know some dogs who have been adopted during during well since the start of the pandemic and who are you know great wonderful dogs but they're just sort of like wait what people that aren't the people in my mm -hmm. house what do I even do <laughs> um but uh yeah uh well that's I those are both lovely lovely kit kitties and thank you for sharing them with us um, welcome and I can show you the other creature oh right <laughs> my, well, I, I don't know if you can see but that tank has <laughs> piranha in it <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing um we don't often get to see piranha on uh, on our core and con interviews so that's i think that might be the first of uh out of the many interviews i've done it might be the first piranha we've had on screen so that's lovely <laughs> yeah, they're they're, lo they're lovely fish they're not as dangerous as people think they are just a bit bitey but <laughs> i stick my hand in the tank all the time to rearrange things oh, yeah. and once, they haven't but, they uh, haven't come for you but I still still feel like a Bond villain. I can stroke my cat menacingly as I and threaten gesture, gesture to my tank of piranhas. <laughs> Brilliant. 
Um, well, my follow-up question, because it has been a long pandemic, which is why everyone wants to see cats, but it also is why uh, my next question is, have you distilled anything good lately? <laughs> Uh, all sorts of things. I actually just recently yeah. bought a really, really nice still that I, I can't mm. show. It's down in the basement, yeah. uh, but I make all sorts of things. I uh, mm. design my own labels as well. So this is my gin that nice. I make. So, ah, ooh, I like that. I also do different types of rum. So a spiced mm. rum, an oak rum, a maple rum. I do one that's um, uh, black pepper. And it sort of tastes like Annie's, like Ooh. like uh, like an ouzo. It's got a very unique taste to it. Uh, so yeah, all, all sorts of things. That's my my weird little side hobby among many. <laughs> uh, I'm actually planning on starting my own like craft distillery as a business right yeah. before quarantine hit, and then just the, I found out about all the laws, and it's just it's not worth it. <laughs> Overwhelming, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I imagine here in, in Canada that, that that's extra complicated. I mean, it's not easy even in the U.S., I think, but it's, but it's like Depends super, the US, super regulated. Yeah, certain yeah. states are basically the Wild West when it comes to liquor distilling. Here in Canada, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. The laws are so prohibitive for small mm. operators, whereas they, the laws really transparently favor larger distillers larger. like Seagram's or yeah. Bacardi or whoever. It's, it's uh, that's too bad. Well. So but... and, and better as a hobby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. Makes me yeah. popular at parties. That's, that's just <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I know that for a fact. Um, and yeah, for anyone wondering, I, I have indeed tasted some of those uh, distilled deliciousnesses. Wow. Yeah, that really didn't come out as well as I was hoping in my head. But um, <laughs> you need a third D to finish the alliteration. Some, there. Yeah, I don't know. I really, really dropped that one. Delightful <laughs> distilled de delicious. Delightless distilled drinks. I yeah. guess would have worked. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I really, like I said, it was a fail. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, for anyone wondering, um, uh, Gilles and I are actually in real life friends. Um, and just uh, coincidentally, Gilles happens to be a writer, although perhaps not so coincidentally, since we got to know each other. Uh, well, actually, no, when we first met, it was totally random and it is coincidence that you write anything. But then I wound up, we got to know each other better when I was in a play that you uh, mm -hmm. wrote and directed. Um, but honestly, we, we actually just met at a con. <laughs> so, so this is very appropriate. <laughs> yeah, again, linked to one of my other random hobbies. So I like, do posters like yes. you see back there for the yeah. 39 World's Fair. And I was selling those at Comic-Con here in Winnipeg, did that for a couple of years. And yeah, yeah. so. Um, so and they're lovely. <laughs> Yeah, and they're lovely, and I have a I have a couple of them. One, well, actually, I think I only I sent the other ones on to to my parents, um, but I I kept uh, one that's on my wall here in the kitchen. Um, too far of a walk to be worth it for the laptop, but it's uh, a really lovely thing that, and everyone should check that stuff out too. Do you still sell them at all, or at least to be oh, yeah, on, on online Etsy, Etsy though? Just okay. yeah, just, uh, just online sales. I found that yeah. with the, the table costs and everything like that at the cons, just wasn't wasn't worth it. Yeah, and keeping managing inventory is hard to yeah, you, as well. You never know what people are going to want. Like right. I, I made a whole bunch of like nerdy sci-fi fantasy stuff for the con. Yeah. And then people wanted like that year, people wanted my aviation stuff. And so right. a lot of inventory went unsold and I ran out of what people actually wanted. So right. online sales are a lot better because it's print on demand. You don't keep yeah. an inventory and if some somebody looks at it and they buy it, that's when they want it. There's no overhead at all. Yeah, that's always nice. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, yeah, so that's yet another um, <laughs> uh, hobby, creative hobby of, of Gilles, um, which I think actually brings us nicely to the next question, which is um, one of the themes that I love, love to talk about with uh, QuarnCon, especially the continuing content series, because during our main event, it's almost all people who we expect to be creative because they're people who are showing up as authors, et cetera. Although it's always interesting when we explore people's day jobs, what their, their other um, interests are. But, um, but with our, with our additional um, continuing content interviews, I have uh, made an effort to start interviewing people who we do not typically consider uh, creative types necessarily. For example, a physicist um, and also you're an engineer. Um, and uh, of course that, is completely inaccurate to think that because someone's um, training or day job is a something that's heavily science uh, oriented, that that in any way negates creativity. Uh, because of course, I think personally that science requires a ton of creativity itself. But beyond that, 
um, you know, people have whatever stereotypes, uh, and, and those are just silly. And we like to crush stereotypes here, <laughs> um, at corn con regularly. Um, but, uh, so, so I would love to talk about, um, the way that cre creativity affects your daily life, um, and then move into the, the question I have about, about engineers, um, you know, typically being considered non-creative people and, and, and are, not artistically creative people and ways in which that's not true either. So, um, so yeah, let's start with, let's start with you and then branch out from you onto other engineers that, you know, <laughs> okay. Uh, so in terms of how creativity affects my life, I think it's more accurate to say creativity is my life. I get pretty antsy when I'm not working on something. I actually find it very hard to just unplug, sit down and read a book that's not mm. research for something I'm doing or watch a right. movie or TV show. I'm just constantly working on this, that, and the other thing. I mean, on this, this table here, I have, you know, my computer, I've got drawings I'm doing for the aviation museum. I'm doing a lot of work with, I've got mm. a stack of books for a presentation that I'm working on for the aviation historical society. I've got scale models I'm working on <laughs> awesome. a gigantic Saturn five I'm doing for somebody just I'm constantly doing something. I think that's just the driving force of my life is I have a lot of skills. I have a lot of passions, I have a lot of interests, and it's just trying to turn that into creative output and express all of that and get all that out before I shuffle off this mortal coil. <laughs> right. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I, I feel similarly about it. Like when I'm making things, whether those are books or art or just crafts, crocheting hats and stuff, whatever, it just feels like you're, you're leaving something behind that's that's sort of concrete and tangible and and it uh I don't know there's something about that that feels good to me anyway mm -hmm. um um so yeah so I mean it's so safe to say that 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 especially these days and but always even even when you were a full-time like engineer desk person <laughs> um you were still doing all of these things as often yes. as you could right Oh yes, of course. Like all my, my spare time was spent doing that. Now I just yeah. have a bit more of an open schedule because uh, like my, now my day job is writing for YouTube. Right. <laughs> very, very weird transition. Uh, you know, a couple of months into COVID, lost yeah. my job as an engineer. Mm -hmm. And then at that same time, uh, today I found out, which is a huge YouTube channel, put mm -hmm. out a video saying we're looking for writers. I'm like, oh, hey, that's exactly the sort of stuff I like to write about. I've got a million weird, wacky stories that I keep yeah. trying to find an outlet for. So <laughs> I submitted a spec script. They're like, yeah, great. How many can you send us per month? And that's what I've been doing ever since. Yeah, that's but, awesome. Uh, but yeah, but th that was only because I had started my own YouTube channel while I was still working as an engineer, just mm -hmm. as a quarantine hobby, you know, an extra quarantine hobby. Sure. And, um, <laughs> got, you know, got very good at writing that type of material. And then I was just able to brush off one of my scripts I'd done for my own channel, add a couple of things, send it to them, and there you go. Nice, that's awesome. Um, <clears throat> so that has, I mean, that has turned into your new like main gig. Um, and then you have many other creative gigs on the side. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about, about, about other engineers that you know, and um, cause let's just completely squash the uh the, mm -hmm. the engineers don't do don't do arts <laughs> creative type uh stereotype and and talk about some other engineers that you know um not you don't have to name names or anybody but like examples of of, of other other engineers that you know uh and and their creative pursuits as well yeah, like, of course so so yeah so i studied at carlton university and mm -hmm. there like immediately noticed that everybody there had some sort of creative passion on the side. A lot of them played, a lot of my um, classmates played instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them sang one of them. I was very impressed. She took, I think she finished like three years of engineering before realizing that singing was actually her passion, quit mm -hmm. engineering and then went to take an, a music program to become mm -hmm. a music major in singing. And it was like, fantastic. Because in, yeah, yeah. you know, there's, the other stereotype and this, this this pressure this sort of cultural thing among engineers like oh we're the ones who are guaranteed jobs and all the artsies mm -hmm. are going to work at starbucks and that right. sort of thing and it's like yeah. that's why i found it very you know very impressive and very commendable that she didn't care that was her passion that's what she was going for rather than mm -hmm. what we could consider the practical right discipline yeah. which you know, you can find a job anywhere. Look at me, like so I'm writing for YouTube. I have an engineering degree, but uh, <laughs> I, make, I make more money working fewer hours doing this. So, hey. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, 
one of the greatest demonstrations of the fact that engineers are like wonderfully creative people in other aspects than just designing things was uh, there's this mutual friend of ours, uh, mm. Kate Sidwall, who yeah. started the uh, engineering musical at Carleton, where she realized that you have all of these people who are highly creative, but have very few outlets outside of their classes because their classes are not providing that sort of outlet. Right. It's very regimented, it's very dry. <laughs> and so to let people indulge in those passions and let off some steam, she started this whole institution now, which has been continuously running ever since at That's Carleton, awesome. where the engineers get together and they write a parody musical uh, and they, they write it, they perform it, they uh, have like everybody who plays an instrument forms a band to score the whole thing. They mm -hmm. build the sets and the costumes and the props and everything like that. It's just this whole amazing production. And then just well, as soon as she announced the thing, people came out of the woodwork. Yeah. <laughs> so many amazing people, people who can sing and dance, yeah. choreograph and all these different, it was just absolutely wonderful to see that. And I think where the stereotype comes from, and this is linked to, to something else, mm. is what I noticed is that not a lot of engineers like to write and people sort of equate, can you write creatively, even yeah. if it's just in an essay mm. with, do you have artistic expression? I think it's mm. this very narrow focus. That is and weird. like the, the class that everybody hated in engineering was the communications class where you had to write reports and essays and things like that. And you really got the impression that everybody who went into engineering or the vast majority, you know, hated English class. Mm in high school and never wanted to do that ever again. They just wanted to do math and draw hmm. blueprints and do things like that. Hmm. But there's, you know, they like drawing, they like expressing themselves visually. A, a yeah. musical it was a lot better medium for expression for a lot of these engineers than, you know, writing poetry or short right. stories or <laughs> a novel or, or anything like that. So yep. I think, yeah, I think it's just this very narrow definition of what it is to be artistic. Right. Whereas, they show that no, there are other ways of expressing yourself, and that really right. came out in these musicals. And they're just a grand old time. The first one was a parody of Rocky Horror Show. Mm, uh, nice. The second was uh, a parody of Grease that was called WD40. <laughs> <laughs> and it just continued on since That's then. That's so uh, cool. Yeah. Um, I knew that I knew that uh, Kiki had done that and I didn't realize uh, but I didn't realize it was still going on, and that's so cool that that became an institution. Mm. Um so I, uh, that pigeonholing you mentioned about, about people who maybe prefer communicating with numbers, et cetera, um, or just a dis dislike for, for writing the way it's presented in school. Um, do you think any of that has to also do with sort of the, the genre focus of, of English lit classes, like the way, the way that that's presented? I mean, I love to write, but I also wasn't as into um, a lot of, of English courses at, uh, in high school and, and university because there was, I mean, I was flat out told numerous times by, by teachers when I tried to include fantastical or sci-fi elements that that was not acceptable. That's not what we were doing. We were writing literary fiction, if we were writing fiction at all, or we were writing just only factual stuff. <clears throat> and do you, do you think that that might, I mean, I know you enjoy historical fiction um, and that might've have, might have been more acceptable in, in a lot of English classes, but, um, but do you think that maybe that has something to do with it too? That if you're, you know, if you really are interested in science that science fiction is maybe a more yeah. alluring topic than, than just fiction. And oh, I, I, I agree entirely that there's, you know, the big problem is, you know, the genre ghetto that, mm. You know, there, there's literary fiction up here and then everything else is just, no, that's inferior. And <laughs> it, it's, I, I don't get it. And it's like, you, if you want people to get into reading, it doesn't matter what they're reading so long as they're reading. And there's a lot of, like at the beginning, like later on, you can talk, you can expand people's horizons, get them to read different things and be interested, right. but get people interested, like give them a compelling story. And to say that you know science fiction is inferior and doesn't have as much commentary or nuance or artistic merit as other genres is complete bunkum. That's what you know science fiction does best is right. social commentary. Yeah, <laughs> it's more philosophical ideas. It does it? It does it in a in a different way sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it does it in the same way, like depending on how character focused the sci-fi is. Yeah. And same with fantasy. 
And yeah, I think, I think there is too much focus on like literary canon and it is right. very, uh, it is very annoying. And like, you know, I, you know, in, you know, some of the stuff that they present, I really liked, you know, through yeah. plus like 1984 and Animal mm -hmm. Farm and Lord of the Flies and things like that. Cool. But then like mm -hmm. Alias Grace, where, you know, you're not really into Margaret Atwood. <laughs> and then, you know, the focus on CanCon, where it's like, it's the old joke, it's sex, death, and grain elevators. <laughs> You've said that joke before, but we yeah. have also discussed before that I am not at all familiar with CanCon, having yeah. not done any portion of my education in Canada. Yeah. But, um, but that, uh, yeah, I mean, that I think that is an issue even if the book selected are slightly different um in the u.s uh, i think it's an issue in the the u.s too and it's um you know i think i got to read bradbury for um mm -hmm. for one of my middle school classes but that's the other thing too is that then you get you're like oh yeah so here's this like light taste of of sci-fi um but it's only by old dead white guys. You're never going to like get to read some yeah. newer stuff that might actually contain even an even bigger cross-section of your own interests. Right. And like, and like you were saying in terms of just getting people to read, mm -hmm. you want them to read a story that's interesting to them. And if the yeah. idea is to encourage that, then you just really kind of want programs that are like read books that you like, if they're graphic novels, if they're fantasy novels, if they're sci-fi, it doesn't matter. Just like, but read, <laughs> you know, and then work from there. Yeah. And like you can, you can do in-depth interpretation and analysis of pretty much anything, like probably one of the, like the greatest resources, and I think should be used as a teaching tool more often is uh, the website TV Tropes. If oh, you, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> if you do a deep dive into TV Tropes, like you start noticing all these different like narrative techniques and mm -hmm. all of the like sometimes cliches, sometimes things, all these things mm -hmm. underlying a story, you can see all the components that stories are built out of. And it's a completely humorous site. Like they come up with all of these <laughs> categories for different things and yep. it's, it's done tongue-in-cheek but it's extremely right. valuable and it's it shows how you can do this very valuable literary analysis of pretty much anything because in the, at the end of the day they're all stories and right. you construct stories in a certain way because we're humans right. and we use stories for particular purposes and yeah. going back to like reading Bradbury I think yeah the, the problem with like sort of canonizing uh, certain works of science fiction where it's like, oh, this is appropriate science fiction. It gets out of date really quickly. Yeah. Like Fahrenheit 451 is like, oh, censorship via burning of books. That's not what censorship looks like today. Right. Yeah. Overall, you do ha still have them. People <laughs> still, that bang. still happens, but yes. <laughs> That's not the way that censorship happens overall anymore. So yes, you can say, okay, well, this is still a problem to this day, but it, it's, it's in a very archaic uh, sense so you know more contemporary science fiction that's more rooted in the problems of today yeah. you know you need to you need to update the canon you need to update what you you teach people it's yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. yeah so there's definitely a, a genre ghetto going on there <laughs> yeah, totally um and i do think it, it it discourages some people who might otherwise be inclined to pursue creative writing um from doing so because they figured that if they're not doing the if they're not doing literary genre fiction they're not you know or sorry non-genre fiction if they're not doing literary fiction that's what i'm trying to say yeah. then they're they shouldn't be doing it at all um and, which and yeah there's a a really funny like incident where i ran into that where like when i found out that wasn't true was when i like i always wanted to write I started out writing sci-fi and mm. stuff that was very I, I love michael Crichton. like my yeah. my big my big like author crush and it was my obsession was Michael Crichton like I read I'd seen Jurassic Park the movie so many times right. and I read the novel I'm like oh my god this guy writes for me it's so detailed and well constructed right. and it's like, loved it and so whatever I would write was like Michael Crichton and people are yeah. like well, nobody cares about the technical details you need to write more character you need to write more issues you need to like nobody mm. cares and then I read The Martian right <laughs> which and I remember <laughs> and I remember finishing The Martian and taking the book and hurling it across the room, not because I hated it, but because it's like, God damn, I was lied to. <laughs> this Turns is... out you can write as many details as you want if you do exactly. it in a clever way. <laughs> exactly. It's like, this is nothing but nerdy, exhaustive detail where he even like calculated the orbits of the planet so that the it, apparently you can, if you're really good at orbital mechanics, you can work mm -hmm. backwards from the text and figure out exactly which year it takes place in because of the positions of the planets. That's amazing. And it's like, that is a ridiculous amount of 
uh, of like pedantry there that I love. Right. It's like, <laughs> extremely successful book got made into an excellent movie. And it's like, dang it, I've been lied to. <laughs> It's true. It turns out there's an audience for everything. And sometimes exactly. that audience is huge if you do it right. Yeah. yeah well, thank God um, for the internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I don't know if you've uh, been, uh, if you're aware enough of, of fantasy niche uh, writing moments, that, but that Brandon Sanderson is now making the general news um, because his Kickstarter uh, is the most successful Kickstarter in history. Um, but Sanderson's a fantasy author. Uh, mm -hmm. He's selling Five, four new fantasy books that he wrote in lockdown. Um, he's a trad pub author uh, for the most part, but he's releasing these independently and using just his Kickstarter as his as his model and um, or as his distribution method. And basically, like it's just he's made millions and millions of dollars off of this, um, yeah. and it's just massively successful. And so, the people who uh, in and outside of publishing are like, "Oh, there's no money in writing fantasy books." And it's like, "Well." <laughs> granted it would be cooler if there were you know if it were maybe like more people looking at more authors instead of you know just a few but still like there's a there's massive money in fantasy books mm -hmm. um and she who shall not be named is uh, you know another <laughs> fine example yeah. of <laughs> yeah. of of making massive amounts of money writing uh writing silly genre fiction um yeah so uh i bite my thumb at those people I guess if we're gonna go Shakespearean <laughs> uh, um, so okay I believe we have thoroughly covered um those those sort of basics um actually so I'll ask you do, would you like to talk a little bit about the details of the book first and then read or read and then talk uh questions about about the the book and how you came up with it which is your preference I should uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit first, but I'll okay. do my reading and then you can, yeah, if you want to ask me some questions about it, just so we get sort of a flavor of what the book is about first. Okay. okay. Um, do you, yeah, do you want to just like jump into to an intro about it or do you want me to ask specifics? I mean, you, you, you know the questions that I have lined up. Do you want me to ask any of those before we start or do you want to just do no, I'll, I'll just start, you know, off the cuff about it. Yeah. All right. Why not? So, yeah. So calling all station, I'll show a nice, you know, nice hard hard cover here. <laughs> uh, I designed the cover as well, because I'm a graphic designer on the side, so, uh, so that was that was fun. Yeah. Um, so, Calling All Stations is an old fashioned adventure yarn. Uh, I grew up reading uh, Tintin and the Tintin, more French. properly pronounced, but Tintin for the audience. <laughs> uh, you know, oh, and uh, love that Treasure Island, like all of these old uh, adventure novels, and so I decided to write something of that type, like something like very traditional, old fashioned swashbuckling sort of adventure. And it, it's interesting how it came about. Mm -hmm. uh, it started out as a short story. So the mm -hmm. first section of the novel was a short story that I wrote because I found out a neat historical tidbit, which is what always happens. It's always discovering <laughs> a neat historical tidbit. And that was that the Nigerian print scam that we we're all familiar yeah. with is actually like 200 years old. And it used to be called the Spanish prisoner scam. Yes. And it was done by letter and then later by telegram. Uh, and then finally by email. Uh, <laughs> and I just thought that was hilarious. And so though, <laughs> what, what, what if it was done by radio? I've always been interested in, in amateur radio. So I wrote this story about this young boy who gets kidnapped by his father who comes back from the war and he gets imprisoned in the um, uh, lighthouse off the Scottish coast. And his only way of communicating with the world is radio. It's very old, like primitive spark gap radio. And it's just sort of showing the, the origins of ham radio. Mm -hmm. And then he gets, spoiler alert, scammed. It's a very small part of the book. He gets scammed <laughs> on the radio. It's, like the good, uh, it's, a, it's a good, like the first 10% of the book, I think. But still, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's, it's the inciting incident. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, Anyway, so not, if you're intrigued, read on. <laughs> so, I do think this. it's uh, it's safe to say that that doesn't spoil anything. No. That you can't guess as soon as it starts, right? Like, <laughs> I think everyone reading that to that, that point is like, oh, no, no. You know, like, it's not like it's, yeah. it's a surprise to him, but not to anyone reading the book. No, anyway. no, like you, you, <laughs> you know exactly what's going on the moment it starts. And it is, exactly. it, yeah, it is that, that sense of like bystander horror. Yeah. We're like, no, don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, okay. uh, but that's, that's what it started out as. It was just this short story called mm. The Spanish Prisoner. Mm. And then a friend of mine who was, you know, bless her heart, she's always not in the Southern bless your heart way, but actually bless her heart. 
<laughs> just to be clear. Legit bless her heart. Not yes, it. legit, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not the Southern F word. <laughs> so she's, re- uh, she's read all of my stories and given really good critique and she's mm. very harsh, but very useful in that, in that sense. Uh, she read it and then she got to the end and she's like, what, that's it? What do you mean, what, that's it? She's like, well, the adventure has to continue I and mean, you can't just end it there. I'm like, oh, yeah, at, at this time I was, you know, young and naive and I thought that short stories were a legitimate way to get into publishing. Uh, little did I know that no, people look for novels and that's it. Uh, I mean, short, the short uh, stories get you into short story magazines, but that's about yes, it. Yes, so, but yeah. I've tried, <laughs> tried and tried and you have to, again, that's a very, you have to be in like literary fiction. And like, anyways, there's a whole yeah. thing. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, it's just like, well, so and I, I started thinking, like, I really didn't want to because I'd finished this thing and I just wanted to be done with it. And then just started slowly thinking about it. So, okay, well, where could the story go from here? What do, like, what setting do I know about? Hmm. And so I remembered I'd been to Morocco a couple of years ago uh, to uh, Ceuta, which is this Spanish enclave in Morocco. I'm like, oh, hmm. that, that's cool. I know about that. And then at the time, light bulb moment, I was reading the history of the French Foreign Legion. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> a lot of it takes place in North Africa and then mm. the whole thing started coming together and then I thought, okay well the conflict I'm going to set it in is the Reef War which was this um, uprising against Spain and France in Morocco in the 1920s. 1920s is a, an era I know a lot about uh, through <laughs> doing artwork from the period yeah. uh, so it all just sort of fell together and then there were just influences from here and there that just kept on on piling in and then that still it, it was a very slow process of writing it where just like a chapter here, chapter that I really wasn't keen on it. And then um, I turned 29 and I realized I'm going to be turning 30 next year and I'm not even going to have a manuscript done. That's kind of sad. You know, I consider myself a writer and I haven't even finished my manuscript. So I set myself a deadline. I said, okay, I'm going to finish this draft this year. And I did. I was writing the last couple of paragraphs on my birthday, (laughs) but I managed to finish it. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) So. <laughs> there is nothing sad about not having a finished manuscript by the time you turn 30 but uh, any yeah. deadline that works for you getting a novel out is is a good deadline <laughs> so <laughs> whatever it is yeah sometimes things get in the way this is okay I'm gonna dampen the mood a little bit but it's something that I've you know I, I've, I've come to terms with is I had set myself a deadline for writing the sequel of June 1st of this mm. year never gonna happen uh, the reason for that was uh, my partner three years passed away in August and she loved the first book. Um, she was my number one cheerleader for it. She kept telling me, it's actually, no, it's really good. It's really good. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to get the sequel done on her birthday to uh, sort of to, to honor her, but that's not happening because the aviation museum has sucked my entire life like a giant dementor. Yeah, fair. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's, all I'll, that's all I'll say about that. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure you'll get it done at some point and it will be yeah. an honor f- regardless. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I think that uh, on that note, we could start with a reading. Um, sure. Depending on what section you're reading from, I just want to warn audience members that there might be abusive parenting. Uh, we like to do content warnings just in case anybody is averse yeah. and wants to bounce out. Yeah, I'm just going to um, write, I'm just going to read the first part of the first chapter. It's a nice okay, so. section. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's probably it, the relevant yeah. one. And also <laughs> pandemic is another yes. relevant. So if, if hearing which, about pandemic and writing bugs you, you might want to bounce out. <laughs> yeah, which I, interestingly enough, complete coincidence. I wrote <laughs> like the shorts of the first part years ago before the, the pandemic was even a twinkle in some bat's eye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wrote it about you know because it's it, yeah. it starts at the end of world war one what happened yeah. at the end of world war one 1918 flu so right yeah and in yeah, fact I, you finished the first version of this novel before the 2020 pandemic even right like, because, right before like right yeah that's what yeah right before like, yeah, <laughs> you know i was you know, spending all of my off hours sending out query letters and mm. then it's like oh well there's a pandemic on now i'm like oh okay well i have other concerns now <laughs> yeah right <laughs> fair all enough right. all right so oh, here we go. So this is part one, The Spanish Prisoner, chapter one, Childhood's End, November 18th, 1918. Like all men from Adam on down, I have looked upon this earth as the good Lord made it, a vast place, solid through and through, where to see distant lands is to wear out one's boots or trust in Neptune's good graces. 
Yet for a few bright moments in this knockabout life, I've seen the walls of time and space fall away and the wide world brought to my doorstep. The sands of Arabia, the jungles of darkest Africa, the jewels of India, all lay but a stone's throw away. Thus I have roved farther than Marco Polo could in three lifetimes. It is only by God's grace that I came to be such a citizen of the world, for there can be no lonelier life than that of a lighthouse keeper. And the beacon on which I found myself marooned at the tender age of eight was the loneliest of them all, the Bell Rock. When the fogs rolled in from the east, you truly felt at the ends of the earth. Had all of creation crumbled around me, I would scarcely have known it. It was here I spent my boyhood days with my father, an old soldier who had traded firing shells across no man's land for firing beams of light across Lunan Bay. That he had answered so, humanita so humanitarian a calling was strange indeed, for father saw the world as one vast leper colony. He was happiest, if I can use that word, when the fog blotted out all sight of shore. Clad in oilskins, beads of spray gathering on his great whiskers, he would stand at the rail for hours, staring out into the gray void, like the exiled king of the walruses yearning for his throne amid the icebergs of the great white north. You could say I had three fathers. I hardly knew the first. Gone off to fight the great war when I was four, he lived mostly in mother's bedtime stories. For, for two years, we awaited his triumphant return when, as mother said, the dastardly Hun would at last be defeated. I had no clue what a Hun was, but I imagined a fearsome dragon with father as St. George on white horse with shining lance, old England victorious again. The knock on the door that bright July day brought not a knight, but the herald and the dreaded telegram. In a far off land called Flanders, St. George had fallen, felled by the dragon's fire. My second father, Cecil, appeared not long after. He was a quiet man, a civil servant of some sort who seldom spoke to me, but he was never cruel or unpleasant, and despite the rationing, we enjoyed the best Christmas dinners and I the best toys in many years. And so, for a while, we were happy. Then, one cold November night, my third father appeared. I was playing by the fireplace with my tin soldiers when he burst through the door, a ghoulish apparition wrapped in muddy khaki and bloodstained bandages. In the middle of his mummified head, a single eye burned with fury, not St. George, but the dragon. The moment that eye fell on mother and Cecil, the mouth below opened and unleashed the most fearsome torrent of bile and vitriol I've ever heard, gnashing and foaming like a mad dog's. And before I could even stand, he seized my arm and dragged me to my feet and towards the door. Mother shrieked and chased after him, begging and pleading as she lashed at his back, but one stroke of his powerful arm sent her crashing to the floor, and I was wrenched out into the cold. Father tossed me into the cab of a waiting lorry, and before I knew it, we were trundling down dark country roads, leaving London far behind. Leaves me for dead, does she? Father muttered, ungrateful little whore. He pulled a little brown, brown glass bottle from his pocket, took a draft, and pulled out down a white cotton mask, the kind I'd seen many people wearing in the streets. He held out the bottle to me, but I refused. Take it, you little shite, he growled. It felt like hot brimstone going down, and for the rest of the journey, I was sick as a dog. We drove for days, sleeping in the lorry and eating from tins of bully beef until at last we reached the coast at our breath. Father bundled me down the quay into a waiting motor launch, and we sailed out onto a cast iron sea. I clutched the gunwales as the shore receded swiftly behind us and was swallowed by the fog, leaving only a gray void in all directions. For a moment, I wondered if Father was trying to cross the North Sea, a mad proposition. Surely we would be drowned. But suddenly a leviathan materialized from the fog, a black wave lost turret towering like a lonely chessman over a vast slate playing board. The bell rock. Welcome home, said father. I would not set foot ashore for two long years. I muted myself so that I wouldn't disturb the reading and that I there, felt to unmute yeah. myself. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, it's such a stirring beginning. I have to say, I, I flew through those those first uh, first few few chapters. Um, it's a very emotional grab, um, and but there there are, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to order my thoughts based on the the reading, like what to to jump into next. Um, you already talked a little bit about some of these. I I think I want to talk about be, because it does touch on these right at the start. Um, one of the questions that I, I, I 
wrote out for you is that there are a lot of challenging issues that appear in this book from, from start to finish. We've, we've got um, abusive parenting, a pandemic, a military occupation of, a, of another country, <laughs> uh, rape, <laughs> and, and other issues besides. Um, so there's a, there are a lot of challenges there as, uh, as an author. Um, how did you handle those in a way that, that felt acceptable to you? I think the best, it's, it's interesting because you would think that it would be challenging to present that from a child's perspective. And mm -hmm. the fact that it was written from a child's perspective was a function of the original short story that it grew out of where, you know, the, the first part of it, yes, there's abusive parenting, but other than, well, there's some corporal punishment, there's not all that much else. It's a fairly, it's benign compared to the rest of it. But <laughs> as I went along and I was like, okay, I want to put this character into a war zone, basically, I realized it's like, well, what do I want to make this story? Is this going to be a kid's story? I have to water everything down or is this just mm -hmm. a story from a kid's perspective? And I realized like, I don't want to water any of this down. Like there were some horrific things that happened. If somebody were actually put in this situation, this is what would actually happen. Mm -hmm. uh, minus some plot armor. <laughs> um, so, but I, I it, eventually, like, I thought it would be a challenge, but I found that it was a lot easier because it's from a naive perspective where mm -hmm. the character accepts what's going on. He hasn't been exposed to it before. So he sort of just accepts this is what's happening and reports it as it is. It says, well, I saw this. Mm -hmm. Or considering that he's writing, probably writing this later, Hmm. There's certain things like you're saying sexual assault where he just he leaves it to the imagination he says like I'm not going to talk about what I saw you know what's right. leading up to it and he's just like yeah no don't want to talk about what I saw right. uh, but otherwise it's very matter of fact and it just allows like it, what happens just sits there and because he's coming at it from a naive perspective he's not providing too much commentary on it where hmm. your character needs to take a stance on it. And that's one mm -hmm. of the things, I think that's one of the things challenging about writing historical fiction is wanting to create compelling characters and sympathetic characters who are not modern characters. Mm -hmm. It's a big challenge because you, you know, you don't want to transplant this person with completely modern sensibilities into this time period. And of course they have all, you know, they believe all the same things that we do today. Mm -hmm. it's, it's out of place. It doesn't seem out of it, it. It doesn't seem right, but at the same time, you can't make them like a horrible, sexist, racist, colonialist bastard. <laughs> I mean, there were plenty of people who objected to those things in the time, right? Like, it's yes. not, um, but they would object to them in perhaps different terms and on different yes. under different contexts. But but there are plenty of people who look at situations like that and go, "That is unacceptable. That is not." Mm -hmm. human that is not humane <laughs> yeah. um but so. doing it yeah, but doing this this way so that the eyes of a child means mm -hmm. that you can have characters like that but you're not making it your protagonist your protagonist is just trying to survive and right. is trying to absorb lessons and this is what's going to be very challenging about writing the sequel because the sequel takes place about a decade and a half later when ah. the main uh, the main character has joined the navy and is serving in china in the late 1930s during the mm -hmm. japanese invasion and the way I've written is that he has learned all the wrong lessons from the first book, where he has become kind of a manipulative bastard, but you still have to, but which would make sense because the right. people he interacts with in this book, and this was, that was one of the fun parts where you don't have to worry about your character leaning one way or the other. You can, prevent, you can present a whole bunch of different characters. You can have a character, like my favorite character to write in the whole thing is his sort of dark mentor, uh, Jacques Moineau, mm -hmm. who is just like, He's Long John Silver. He's just a, a charming but horrible person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but where, and so, uh, and so, your MC winds up taking on some of those traits in the in the second yes, book. <laughs> because of course, if you're if you're twelve yeah. and you don't know anything other than these horribly abusive people, and like one of them happens to take you under his wing for a mm. long time and tries to teach you the rules of life, which are basically here's how you can like steal and cheat your way out of anything, right. uh, you're going you're gonna to take that to heart. That's going to be very formative for you. You're not going to turn out to be uh, <laughs> a completely well-adjusted person, especially not if you join the Navy immediately. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of ways that that's uh, yeah. Yep. Um, so, uh, so then, yeah. So then the struggle becomes pre presenting him uh, in a way that's at least compelling enough to the reader. The reader's not just like, Oh, I don't, I don't don't want to, I don't want to read more about you. You seem awful. So they have yeah. to want to read more about them while they also seem awful, which is a challenge. <laughs> Very much of a challenge, although that's, that's not the biggest challenge I'm, I'm facing. It's the, the fact that 
I wrote Calling All Stations, I, I said it in the place that I did because I already had enough of a background because I'd been to Morocco. Mm. I know a lot about uh, Morocco. I know a lot about the French mm. Foreign Legion. I knew enough about the setting that I was able just like to come up with stuff quite easily. Right. It was something I was familiar with. Whereas mm. 1930s China requires so much research and I've just, yes. and I don't, and so just trying to read as much as I can about it just to get an idea. Mm. Uh, but again, that's part of you. one of the questions you wanted to ask was, does the research get in the way of the writing? <laughs> yeah. Yes, but not in the way you might think. It's just because I have so little time to do the writing that I enjoy. And there's always that, you know, that first draft resistance where you're so mm. concerned about it not coming out right the first time. And you, mm. you actively resist the fact that there will be multiple drafts. Right. <laughs> like, like, no, I have to get it right now instead of like, no, I and, have to make notes to go back and fix. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing in terms of the, the history and how history informs the story is I want to make sure that I have all of that as squared away in my head as possible before I start writing so that there will be as few drafts as possible. Because if I just mm. like write it right now without knowing all that much about the period, it's going to end up being horribly inaccurate. I'm going to have to rewrite it multiple times as I write. Right. Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's an interesting point because when the where the where the historical accuracy is actually going to directly affect the plot yeah that becomes that becomes a problem right you're like oh i came up with this idea to solve you know this plot issue but then you're like oh no i can't actually do that because that would not have happened mm -hmm. um and of course you know for my books that's okay because i'm not actually yeah. writing anything historically accurate but that's if you're if you want to write and there also there's all like i feel like there's all shades of historical fiction uh, mm. in terms of ac degree of accuracy but i know how much you prize historical accuracy in in your uh media so i'm sure that you are definitely writing to the this is all true except for the particular life of this character yeah. <laughs> type of historical and, fiction you know and i'm i'm not averse to a certain amount of artistic license so you mm. have to use it to get to get your story going through so like one of the main and you know some of the stuff is just super obscure one of the mm. main plot points in the latter half of the novel is mm. the character gets shown how to build what's known as a foxhole radio which is this very mm. simple radio you build out of junk like a yeah. strand of wire and a razor blade and things like that <laughs> right. um that probably would not have been a thing yet mm. in history that was a world war ii thing ah, okay but so you've pushed it, it back would have, it would have <laughs> been like crystal radios existed like people right. used them at home they had purpose-built ones so it, it right. would have been technically possible to build one but i wasn't able to find any evidence that people were had been doing it yeah yeah in 1921 but i thought screw it it's the <laughs> only thing that works in this particular context in right. the middle of the desert and he needs to find <laughs> his way somewhere he needs a radio right so I'm going to let him do it. Well, he also, he's thing. presented as enough of a, I don't want to say genius because I, I feel like we maybe throw that around too much, but, yeah. but, but certainly in this particular area, in the area of radio, he is yeah. so well versed and good at it from his very yeah. like extensive experience with it yes. in, in his, in his little limited context, right? That like, it Although, makes sense that he would be, if anyone were going to be able to figure that out, it's yeah. a, it seems plausible that he would. Well, in that particular case, he doesn't come up with, he's shown oh, he's, by he's shown, a, right. a World War I veteran uh, okay. how to do it. And he says, well, we used to do this in the trenches, which is not, <laughs> not quite true, but it's right, the only okay. way that it, that it fits. Like he figures it's different. <laughs> the, the point is like, he knows, yeah, he knows how to repair like the radios he's had interactions right. with and he knows Morse code super, super well, but this right. particular, he doesn't figure it out. He, he gets shown how he to do it. it. Okay. He gets shown it, okay figures out yeah. how to use it but but that was one thing where it's like it's plausible enough I'll let it slide yeah yeah well I mean and that's yeah I think every author has to do that to some degree in any form of writing um I actually there's a uh historical romance series that I really love um written by Courtney Milan um and her there's there's one of her series basically is almost an alternate, I mean, it is essentially an alternate history, but everything she writes is historically plausible. It just mm -hmm. didn't happen then. So she takes tech, for example, that is absolutely would have been possible in that time period, but mm -hmm. wasn't actually invented in, until say like a decade or two later or something mm -hmm. like that, you know? Um, but just like all the components were there, all the, all the other pieces that were needed to, for the groundwork were there. It's just that nobody thought to combine them that way until this other point in time in actual history, but they certainly could have been thought of earlier but, if, if and, someone- And probably somebody did, but it's, you know, been like, either lost to lost. history or it's not cool. very well known. I mean- yeah. Um, you know, when do you like when was a fax machine invented? Late 19th century, very first fax mm. machine. 
Mm, and then cool. the first like very practical, like the mo the model for the modern fax machine was around mm -hmm. the 19, um, the 1920s uh, by Sir William Stevenson, who was a spy mm -hmm. master from Winnipeg. <laughs> and cool. he ran a big spy network during uh, during World War II. So, um, so yeah, so these, these things where it's like, you think, oh, it hadn't been invented until much later. Well, they mm. tried, but it wasn't practical or mm. the inventor couldn't get uh, the funding or right. didn't have the circumstances to, to carry it forward. And mm. it happens all the time. There are right. tons of inventions that are like fantastically before their time. So yeah. yeah. And again, that's the whole diesel punk and steampunk genre is True. <laughs> what, can you, what, can you, what can you do with the technology at the time to right. recreate the, uh, um, the technologies that we have today. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I love stuff like that. And I think that that's, that's all really fun. And so anyway, personally, I allow a lot of license for that in other people's writing, but then I also, I mean, I'm a fantasy person, so I'm all about the just like random what ifs, as long as it fits within the context of the story that's being told. So, um, but I think yeah. there's, there's a lot more crossover than a lot of people think where they say, oh, fantasy, mm. you can do whatever, whatever you want, but no, like you can easily identify bad fantasy when the rules aren't consistent, when you're just, that's yeah. It, it, when, you, when you break your own rules, like whatever, you've established a rule and then you just throw it out the window. And that's the thing that I think most of us are, are pretty resistant to mm -hmm. uh, as readers. And uh, yeah, and that's the thing you, you, know, you try to avoid. But uh, yeah, you can the, establish whatever re rules you want, but then you have to follow them or come up with a very convincing explanation of why that's no longer the case. But that's yeah. a hard sell. <laughs> and, and to me, like I haven't written fantasy, it that mm -hmm. sounds like a much harder thing to do like you know historic historical fiction is hard because you need to do a lot of research to make mm -hmm. sure that oh this could have happened or this person would have been but at least it's there <laughs> coming up with plausible rules for a world <laughs> you know because the rules of our modern world are when you you try to to dig down and figure out like why does why do we do this why does this work like why is this why are the stakes this way mm -hmm. it's fiendishly complicated and you know hats off to anybody who can come up with a plausible alternate world that works in a completely <laughs> different way to the the world as we know it that that sounds Don't terrifically it. difficult <laughs> yeah it is it, i'm well, at least working with existing bits and pieces right and that's the thing is like you know personally i always i always have a grounding in the actual world usually because it just it does help <laughs> it saves a lot of time in all that world building but i really love reading works of sci-fi or fantasy that really don't have any grounding mm. like either a planet that is that functions so differently from earth and life on that planet functioning so differently from earth that it's not really comparable um or uh or or fantasy that takes you know it's an alternate mm. world and and things are so different that they're not yeah that's always really fun for me as a reader and and someday i may try to do that with my own work mm. but i feel like uh right at least for now that's too too much for me to to bite off um Okay, well, we've really covered a lot of our, our questions. Um, doo, 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 doo. Okay, we do, we, you talked a little bit about how um, you wrote Calling All Stations as an adventure yarn because of the, the books that had inspired you. Mm. Um, and you also talked a little bit about um, the age of that, that character. Actually, you actually, never mind. I can't, I was like, I was thinking there was some part of this question left unanswered, but the truth is no, we've covered it all because you also talked about um, the particulars of the story and, and why, why uh, our main character winds up on that particular adventure. Um, so never mind. I, that's actually, <laughs> I thought there was one part of that question left, but there is not. Uh, okay, well, is there anything else you would like to add? Because um, we've also talked about research. Um, oh, actually, let's talk a little bit about, so talking about like the research that, that you do for, for some of these stories. Um, and I know that a lot of it you, you find fascinating. Um, are there some things that you find fascinating and you, you love them, but you then are, you don't actually put them in the book just because they would bog down story pacing? Or do you try to cram as much in as you can and hope that the readers are, are, are similarly interested? Or what's, what's your, your choice? with that? Um, unless it's relevant to the plot, I go more in terms of like building flavor and iceberg theory, uh, <laughs> if, you know, if, if you're yeah. familiar with that, um, where like I'll use 
a word that you can figure it out what it is in context, but you know, if you don't know the word, you can you can look it up just right. to make or you know, reference reference events where it's like, oh, it makes sense for them to say that, but you have mm-hmm. to <laughs> you have to we'll do that, yeah. figure out what, yeah, what, what rabbit hole that leads you down to. And it's, you know, it, 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 it's interesting. Um, one example is, so there's two, like there's a whole bunch of antagonists in this. There's, it's just like, it's a character is being tossed into this like really? wretched, <laughs> hive, wretched hive of scum and villainy. And so like the French sailors- he just runs from one bad person into another. Yeah. He's like, oh, I just escaped that. Oh shit, now I'm confronted by a new villain. Ah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so there's, yeah. So the, all, a whole bunch of like awful people are, you know, not, even if they're not awful, they're, they're questionable. So you have, mm. yeah, you have the sailors he's with who are all mm. mercenaries. Uh, you have the, the Spanish authorities in Morocco who are all horrible. And then you have the, the Moroccan rebels who, you know, while I try to present them sympathetically, we're also constantly fighting with one another mm. and murdering each other to be like, no, we are the ones who are going to liberate the country. Mm. But, <laughs> but, so, but there's this offhanded comment too. It's like, oh, I wouldn't be surprised if this leader kidnapped this person because mm. El Rasuli did that back in 1905. Do you remember the Petacaris case? And if you look, that's a whole thing. There's a movie with Sean Connery about this incident. It's called The Wind and the Lion. And this okay. was all whole this whole thing. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love putting that in where it's like they almost hit, like they're going. Uh, Just like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like they're, they're trying to navigate past the Moroccan coast at night with their lights down because they don't want to be arrested. Yeah, and right. They, and they, they, bar- they almost barely miss this other ship. And then he yeah. sees the, the name of the ship as it passes by. And it's a ship that just a few years later would collide with another ship and sink in the English Channel. <laughs> So you've got lots of historical Easter eggs. Uh, oh, I, like, I, I love it because it's just like, okay, well, I can't really talk about this, but okay, well, there's a ship here. What joke can I make? Right. With that? <laughs> so, so yeah, and, there, and I love, I love putting in, putting in those little things and just mm. the, the, the stuff that adds flavor. Like one of the, the fun, there were two fun things that came out of this book in particular on the history of the French foreign legion. Uh, one very funny, the other horrific. So the very <laughs> funny one is that in, uh, traditional like North African culture, uh, mm-hmm. and I think in much of the Middle East as well, there's this sort of respect for people who are suffering from mental illness, where mm-hmm. if you, people will leave you alone, they think you're blessed by God, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, they'll, they'll leave you alone. And so what deserting legionnaires would do is they would like strip naked, and just like, walk around and people would just leave them alone. They wouldn't report them. Okay, they, would, well, that guy's... They, they would give they would give them food and shelter. And they just, and yeah, like one guy made his way from, like, from Algiers to like the Atlantic coast of Morocco, like across two countries, just naked. And having people help him because they assumed he'd, he'd lost it. Yeah, he lost um, it. That, that shows up in the book where the, the two legionnaires <laughs> are talking about it. It's like, you know, why, why are they not touching that guy who's suffering from PTSD? It's like, oh, because mm. of this. Oh, you remember that one guy that we, that we knew <laughs> who made his way naked across the country? Oh, yeah, that guy was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> the other one that isn't really explained, and this is another thing, it's a, it's, it's a real deep cut, but it mm. gets used somewhat, is the horrifying game of cuckoo. Which is the like most extreme version of Russian roulette you've ever heard of? That was practiced by the French Foreign Legion. Okay. Where a bunch of guys stand in a darkened room with their pistols out, and one guy runs into the darkened room, yells "cuckoo," and tries to get out before they all shoot him. Oh my god! <laughs> this is a thing they used to do. How? Oh, to be bored and a sociopath. Um, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, okay. so there's, yeah, so there's a scene in there where they, um, uh, all the sailors who are all legionnaires before have to right. kill, like they execute somebody and they say, hey, do you want to play a game of cuckoo? And then they just aim at the guy and the guy's like, oh, no way I'm getting out of this. Cuckoo. And then he gets killed. Right. Gotcha. And, but it's something where it's like, I never explain it because I just thought I, I actually had. Oh, yeah. Line. How would you? Yeah, yeah. I had a line where it's like, well, what the, what, up with, what was up with that? Oh, yeah. this is what we used. And I thought, you know what? It doesn't need to be explained. Yeah. No. It's so it's, it's a weird thing. You just roll with it. <laughs> Either look it up or move on. <laughs> yeah. Although I don't know where you could look it up. It was just like an, I, I just randomly came across it in this book, and I don't know if anybody else has ever written about this anywhere. I don't know. So, anyways, I, that but, is... <laughs> but yeah, so I I am fairly disciplined about not 
letting the research overtake the work. Mm -hmm. the, the research is in the service of the story, yeah. not the other way around. Although yeah. it's harder another, actually you, you were asking, uh, one of the mm -hmm. questions that you had was whether I find it easier to write plays or write. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so right. I must have scrolled that. past that one. <laughs> but uh, like, to answer, I'll answer that question yeah, first. Yeah, go ahead. Much, easier, much easier to write plays because I was talking about that whole like engineers are more visually oriented. Mm. If I had all the money in the world, These if I were a rich man, I would be making films, not writing right. novels. Yeah, yeah. I, I think far more in cinematic terms, mm -hmm. but I do not have those resources. <laughs> I'm not sure I have any intention of going to film school and going through all that rigmarole. So for the time being, <laughs> the more cost-effective way of getting my vision out there is either to do stage plays or right. to write novels. Right. And I much prefer writing stage plays or film scripts because mm. I, I get bogged down. Uh, I get, I wouldn't say get bogged down, but I get frustrated with writing description of mm with writing descriptions of places or action, things like that. I'm right. much better at writing the dialogue. The dialogue mm. comes naturally. If mm. you make a film or you have a play, you just get people to act the way you want them to. You don't have to spend a paragraph describing and worrying whether it's poetic enough. Right. Um, yeah. So, um, but in terms of the, like the, the play I'm working on right now um, mm. is on the Voyager Golden Record, which is uh, just for the benefit of the, of the audience, uh, is a, an L, a gold-plated LP that was sent into space aboard the Voyager space probes in 1977 mm. that was a, a time capsule of humanity. It had music and pictures and mm. sounds and all sorts of things of Earth right. in 1977. And then the Voyager probes, uh, there were two of them, uh, went and visited the outer planets and then went off into the cosmos. And they are the most, along with the pioneer probes, which were sent a couple of years before, are mm. the most distant objects from Earth, man-made mm. objects from Earth. Right. Uh, so the, the play that I'm, I'm currently producing is about how Carl Sagan and his crew came up with this idea and how they chose everything and all mm. like the interpersonal conflicts and drama there was before. Because you, you read into the, the making of this thing, it's like Fleetwood Max rumors, but science. <laughs> Which makes sense. I mean, it would be so fraught, right, to try to decide what the what you what sampling of Earth you want to send yeah. into the universe. Like, but more literal than that, where Carl Sagan left his wife and got with another person on the team while this whole project was going through. Well, you know. Yeah. That, so there's yeah. <laughs> anyways, also that. <laughs> This is one where it's like there. That's one where I've really had to kill my darlings because there's so many things on this record that are worth mm -hmm. talking about. Like, why did they choose this, or how did this right. picture come about? Uh, why did they do this and that and the other thing? Just so many fascinating stories. Because I did a whole bunch of research on this, right. and then in rehearsing it, realizing this is fun doesn't tie into the main story. This is just oh, look how much research I did. Aren't I a clever boy? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, yeah, yeah. I, I like it's I, I really want that to be there because it's cool but cut cut yeah. cut it's had to yeah. remove so much of it because all of it seems cool because it, it's this 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 big thing this hole that's just so fascinating in and of itself there's so much to dive into but you really right. have to focus on the story you're trying to tell and right. and you always have to remind yourself that nobody's going to know what's missing right like, unless they actually know the history unless they go and read up on it afterwards or they already know they're not going to know what you cut out. It's right. not going to seem incomplete or picked apart or right. anything like that. It's just yeah. going to be what it is. So far as they know, that's how it always was. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, I think that's true for any work of art too, right? Like yeah. we always worry about, oh, I, you know, if I had this out, is it, is, it on, is it not whole anymore? And it's like, well, I mean, people only see the final product and they mm -hmm. really are, that's the only thing they, they judge by. And I think it's, it's, maybe potentially more fraught when you're dealing with something that's a very well-known bit of history, mm -hmm. but that's typically not what you deal in when you're no, writing no, these, these plays and stuff. And so, um, yeah, there's the bits that you just sort of like, well, you know. And that's the advantage of reaching into the obscure corners of history is that, you know, who's going to contradict you? <laughs> <laughs> True. <They don't> <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, I mean, yeah, it's not like you're not leaving it out out of spite or anything. It's just sort of like you have you have limited time, you have limited you have either limited running time or you have limited time to convey the plot. You like and you gotta you know sacrifices must be made. Oh yeah, and you have to create composite <laughs> characters or create new characters. Like you remember from Sport of the Engineer, yeah. <laughs> there were a total a grand total of two characters in there that were real. 
Right. <laughs> and just because in the original work never mentions any names. Like right. I met this person and this person yeah. for the, for anonymity, for their security. I've omitted all their names. Like, okay, well, I've got a blank canvas now. Yeah, exactly. Just make people up. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and you know, again, more historical in jokes, like one of the, my, my, my most, <laughs> you made them Tom, Dick and Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Tom, Dick, yeah. Made them Tom, <laughs> Dick and Harry. And then the, the three French uh, soldiers are uh, uh, Pierre Paul et Jacques, which is yeah. the French, French, <laughs> Tom, Dick and Harry. French version Tom, Dick and Harry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then like, and for, for calling all stations, one of the, the fun things I did at the, the very end, and this isn't much of a spoiler, but there's a character who shows up at the end who's a pilot and mm. makes reference the fact that he's writing and he's like oh this little boy came out of the desert i'm sure there's something in there and it's <laughs> it's is that uh, the 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 the, the antoine de saint exupery the, the, the little prince the little prince yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why i was doing this i was like the comet was what i was trying to my yeah. brain would not come up with the word comet little prince that's hilarious <laughs> oh <laughs> because he would have been in the area at the time yeah <laughs> that's like, actually <laughs> i was like wait a second oh yes <laughs> 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 that's awesome excellent excellent for an additional reference um well (laughs) all of that is is honestly fascinating and uh, Gilles of course you know that I could talk to you for ages because we haven't (laughs) we haven't have had very very long chats um but uh we we do need to wrap soonish so I'm gonna move us into um to the later questions all right and now here I see I hadn't gotten yet to the the plays or novels but you've answered that so obviously the only, the only thing left is the most important question of the entire yeah, interview, yeah. which is if you could have any fantasy animal companion, what would it be and why? <laughs> hey, does this have to be like a classic fantasy animal? Does it have to be just like- Anything you want. It can, be from, it can be from a work of fantasy that, that, that you have read, one that exists in your head, one that's from mythology, one like you pick, yeah. anything you like. Uh, I'd probably have to go with Luck Dragon from Neverending Story. Uh, lot, <laughs> pick up a lot of real estate. I'd have to expand my garage. <laughs> but get to fly everywhere and just so darn cute. So, so cute. Darn cute. That is true. That is true. Um, oh my gosh, I've briefly forgotten the Luck Dragon's name. Uh, Falcor. Falcor, thank you. Jeez. Oh, the things... I just recently, I recently reread the, like, the, the book, oh, the yeah? Neverending Story. It's a trip. Is it? <laughs> It's a, it's so bizarre, but it's, good. it's, it's, it's just, it's pure imagination. Yeah. It's very episodic. Like okay. it's, it, it reads like 50 fantasy short stories stitched together. Interesting. But it's very good. And it does some like Thomas Pynchon-esque self, like plot self-destruction sort of things where like the novel, like the novel and the fantasy world in the novel erase right. itself and rewrites itself halfway uh... through cool like it, it like completely breaks the fourth wall and then comes back in and completely like re- rejigs itself it's wild that's cool um i've actually never read the book i've i there are many many of those classics i i have like fantasy movie classics i have made a point of going and reading the book um but i haven't actually read the never ending story before now maybe i want to or maybe oh, i you, don't you do you do, I do. okay <laughs> all right <laughs> it's love, great it's like love- bizarre but great (laughs) um i will have to add it to the list um well i would like to urge anyone watching to uh go ahead and grab a copy of calling all stations um it is uh it's a gripping tale and uh, keep in mind the 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 issues that we mentioned before if any of those are content warnings for you that things that you prefer to avoid there are some complicated issues represented in the book but it is it is well told and yeah. not uh, a anything? children's book we'll not a children's book yes children's okay. book. do not do not buy this for <laughs> children under the age of 15 yeah it's something like unless that. they're unless they're you know very mature and used to dealing with heavy topics yeah don't yeah. don't let it fool you it started it started as a children's book and then it, <laughs> it, it, then it was not <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it, it i would say there. yeah that's right it's got how old is the protagonist he's 12 I mean, He's twelve. Okay, that's what I thought. I was just, but I was like, uh, but he, he starts. He starts. He starts out, at like nine, right? He like starts at eight, eight or nine. Yeah, he starts eight, at yeah. eight. He starts at eight, and then mm-hmm. he's twelve for most of it. And that was mainly done to sort of sync up with uh, Jim Hawkins in Treasure Island because it does ah. reference him a lot, and it's supposed to be a, a sort of spiritual sequel or uh, <laughs> yeah, a pastiche of some, right. of some sort. Uh, so yeah, Jim Hawkins, and I think is around. 
10. I can't, okay. I can't remember, but around basically young enough to be naive, but old enough to be competent. Sure. Right. You get, when you're about 12, you start getting there where you could <laughs> presumably survive a harrowing adventure through the desert without you know, immediately dying. <laughs> <laughs> but you are also gullible enough to just believe yes. every adult who talks to you, yes. <laughs> which this character has an issue with, which, but it's a, it's a magical sense. age. Yeah. <laughs> it's a magical age. Um, fair enough. Uh, yeah. So it is, it is a 12 year old main character, but we would not recommend it for 12 year old readers in general, <laughs> unless they are very mature. Um, I mean, the truth is I probably would have read this at age 12 or younger and mm. fine with it, but you know, it's way <laughs> I always feel weird about like, you know, I would have read my own books at that age as well, but I also don't recommend my own books for kids that age. So um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Viewer discretion for, is advised. Viewer discretion advised, exactly. There you go. Um, excellent. Well, um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. And thanks to everyone who has stopped by. We've had a few, few viewers off and on, um, no, no audience questions uh, that came up. Although I didn't actually stop and make time for it, which I often do, but. Um, if anyone does have questions for Gilles, um, he is findable on the internet. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm sure uh, uh, if Gilles, if you wanted to post a link uh, comment in the, the YouTube comments later, you can do that with a link to your own website or wherever you would like people to find you. If they have questions, they can get in touch with you there. Um, in the meantime, I have lo linked the book itself in the description, um, the Amazon link, unfortunately, um, but you, anyone who's looking for it can find it also via uh, bookshop.org, I think, and, and any of those other sort of wider distributors, because it is published through Friesen Press um, and therefore should be available through any bookstore, should be able to order it. Um, and so please check it out. It's a, it's a delightful adventure tale. And, um, and thank you so much, Jill, for, for coming and talking to us. And um, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, and I know I already said that, but I'm thanking you twice. So, um, but uh, everyone, again, one last reminder, Corn Con, the main event is April 7th to 11th. Please mark your calendars and get ready for that schedule because it's coming out soon. Um, that's it. Thanks so much. I'm going to hit the button to end the live stream and we're done. Okay, we're no longer live. Awesome. Uh, but I will also hit in.